we are. Right, okay. Be live, Chair. Lovely, thank you very much. I know the meeting's meant to start at 10, but there's there's a couple of key people that are still not here, so I'm a bit concerned. I propose to wait until five past 10, and then we're going to start the meeting, if that's all right with everybody. If anybody doesn't agree, then you need to indicate by putting your hand up. Nope. So we'll wait a few more minutes. Good. <laughs> Right, well, welcome everybody and thank you very much. I'm going to start the meeting now. So it's great to see so many people here. Can I first of all, though, ask for apologies for absence? Graham. Yes, Chair, I've got apologies from Andy Williams from the CCG, but Carolyn Trefithic, um is going to substitute. And I've had apologies from Oliver Newbold from NHS England, but Hayley Jackson's here. And I've had a Apologies from Rebecca Brown, the Acting Chief Exec of UHL, but Mark Whiteman's here. Excellent. Thank you. Oh, sorry. And Andrew Fry from the University of Leicester. Right. OK. So can I just move on then to declarations of interest from members? Are there any declarations of interest from members? Please indicate by raising your hand. No? Thank you. Let's move on then. Minutes of the previous meeting. The minutes have been circulated. I take it that everybody has read them. So first of all, can I simply ask, can we confirm these as an accurate record? Again, anybody who doesn't agree, please indicate by raising your hand. No? Lovely, thank you. So I'm confirming them as an accurate uh, correct record. Um, I'm not aware of any matters arising. Is there anything that anybody wishes to, to raise? No? Okay. So let's move on then. I want to say welcome to everybody to what is an incredibly important meeting. We've got some people here today that this is their first meeting. So we've got David Sisling. David, do you want to just introduce yourself briefly? Yes, thank you very much. Yeah, no, very happy to join today's meeting. I'm here in my role as the indep independent chair of the Leicester, Leicestershire and Rutland Integrated Care System. We've just been given approval for our ICS to come into formal existence on April the 1st, which is good news and will be, I'm absolutely confident, having a positive impact on the way we deliver care, more joined up, more integrated, but more focus on health, well-being and health inequalities. So very, very happy to join this meeting today and uh, future ones also. So thank you. Absolutely fantastic. In actual fact, we will be looking to formalise um, David's position on the board, um, but that has to go through um, uh, certain procedures. It has to go through full council. So that will be done at the next full council meeting. Um, and then that will be able to formalise David's role 
um, and position on the board. And I think that's incredibly important that we have that real tie-in between the board and ICS. And again, that's further evidence of, of mm -hmm. our commitment mm -hmm. locally uh, to work in partnership. And I, I think that's very helpful. We also have Mukesh from um, Health Watch. Do you want to just briefly introduce yourself? Good morning, Chair, colleagues. Uh, my name is Mukesh Barrett. I'm the Chief Officer for Healthwatch Leicester and Healthwatch Leicestershire. Excellent and welcome and look forward to working with you. And we also have Catherine. Catherine, <coughs> want to just briefly introduce yourself? Good morning. Thank you, Chair. Uh, I'm Catherine Packham. I'm a consultant in public health at Leicester City Council. I started a month ago and my main uh, remit is to further develop and strengthen the work and links between public health and the NHS commissioners and also working with the uh, developing integrated care system. Thank you. Great and welcome, Catherine. And again, I think that this extra investment and, you know, I, I have to say a huge thank you to Peter, uh, Peter Salisbury, our city mayor, for giving us this extra investment in public health that's, that has made um, this role possible. Because, again, it's, you know, we are absolutely committed to partnership working, but partnerships take, take work to develop. They don't just happen. We have to help them and um, work together to make them happen most effectively. And so, you know, I'm really, really pleased um, that we've been able to um, have this investment and you, your role is incredibly important to us, Catherine. Now, we do have three very important agenda items. So I'm not going to waste a lot more time uh, before we move on to the first one. And the first one is looking at the inequalities framework. And again, um, this is something that we all, we all knew about the health inequalities in, in the city, in the country prior to COVID. But of course, with COVID, it has really shone a light on, on what those issues are. And Again, this has been a partnership piece of work. I don't want to take anything from Sarah and, and Mark um, who have led on this piece of work, but it is a partnership piece of work. And Catherine, do you just want to just very briefly explain the role of public health in it? Thank you. Yes, so this has been developed collaboratively, although as Councillor Dempster has highlighted, Sarah and Mark have uh, led on this. Uh, and public health has been involved with trying to work on the evidence base that we work with all, all the time in terms of the main public health principles that are really important uh, within the things that can really make a difference for health inequalities in terms of the various principles that Sarah and Mark will highlight. I don't want to steal their thunder, but I think it's really important to explicitly set out these common principles and goals because we can all make a difference from a individual organisation point of view, but it's such a complex issue, health inequalities, that we really need to work together as a system and all of the roles that we have within the system because of the uh, how, degree to which all of those factors interact. Uh, and um, so one individual doesn't just come into contact with individual services, they're a holistic person that all of the organisations and services they come into contact with will have an impact on their health and well-being. So it's really working together will have that biggest impact on health inequalities. Uh, and that's why it's really important for us as a place, as a Leicester system, if you like, as well as Leicester, Leicestershire and, and the kind of high level integrated care system. But for Leicester as, a, as its own system to look at how we can take this work forward to really make a difference together uh, as well as individually as organisations to really tackle health inequalities, which is such an important issue, which we, we all agree on, I'm sure. Thank you, Councillor Dempster. Absolutely. So without further ado, I'm going to pass over to Sarah and to Mark. And, and you know, given um, that we're having a presentation and you know, it's, it's a bit different on Zoom, I think, um, We'll wait until the very end of the presentation before those questions, if that's okay with everybody. Thank yeah, you. Okay. So, 
I have had a few technical problems this morning and I haven't been asked to um, get into Zoom in the normal way. So I'm not going to, sh I can't share the presentation, but I will go through it, Council of Dempster, if that's all right. Lovely. So I, I just wanted to thank everybody for the opportunity to come and speak to you today about this really important subject. And I, I think we'll start right at the very beginning, just remind ourselves, I don't think any of us need reminding of this, but we do, we do need just to, as we go through the presentation, and particularly this discussion we, we get onto at the end, remind ourselves that health inequalities are prevent, preventable and unfair and unjust differences are they are things that we can do something about um they're not easy to tackle as we've experienced over uh, over the years but they are things that we can do something about if, particularly if we work collectively together so as Kath said what we've tried to do is to set out quite a high level sort of health inequalities framework that sets out what we want to achieve over the coming years as a as a as a integrated care system um, and it's, the framework itself sets out a number of principles and high level actions, which I will go through in a moment. But I, but we need, but I want to acknowledge that although this is a system framework, we, we, um, we know and understand that most of the actions will be taken at place. So at place, and for this discussion today, that is obviously Leicester City, that's where um, we'll be rooting our main actions, we, where we understand the detailed need of the population and how we can harness those wider services and relationships together to try and make a real difference. So some of um, some of the high level principles, I'm not gonna go through why health inequalities is important. I think most of you know that we've got a huge life expectancy gap in the city and particularly the healthy life expectancy gap. And I think the diagram on the, um, on the sixth slide really shows that that happens throughout the life course it's not just at certain points um so we've set out a few overarching principles that um will help us guide our work i think on, on this agenda so first and most importantly it's everybody's business i think as the public sector we've got a huge part to play in harnessing our resources and our skills and experience to to tackle this problem it's got to be rooted in, a, in, a, in an approach to population health management, particularly when you take that life course approach into account. And we must focus on the wider determinants of health. As most of us know, only 20% of outcomes around health is to do with the actual health care. The rest is to do with those wider determinants of health. We have to have a focus and a relentless uh, push to making sure there's parity of steam between uh, mental and physical health so this isn't just about physical health it's about mental health and well-being as well and I think we need to work we need to think about how we work collectively together as a public sector across LLR and, and in places to make a real difference and there's a real push nationally around um, developing anchor institutions and one of the things that we want to do as a part of this process is to do something around that now I know as a city council you've been doing some work in relation to that uh, and but I think we need to set out some um, principles around anchor institutions that we might adopt collectively across LLR. Um, Investment's important you know we, we need to think about how we invest in our services against the, the relevant need and we need to use data really well to support our, our interactions. And one of the things that we do need to do is get better at data, actually. There are some gaps in data, particularly in understanding um, the different groups that use our services or may not use our services. And then there's, then there's think around how we harness the voluntary sector and our communities. This shouldn't be a top-down approach. It needs to be built from communities and up. Um, and our and our actions should be uh, those actions that communities really feel make a difference. I was listening to somebody yesterday who was articulating uh, the difference in approach to how they had um, put actions in around COVID between the health institution deciding what was best, but then asking the public what they decided was best. And it completely changed the scenario in terms of what they were actually um, decided to deliver. And we must remember that. Um, as I said, I think it's about the whole life course um, from, from, from pre-birth through to, through to death. 
And we need to be accepting we've got an accountability as a system to do something about this. As we move into the ICS world, and particularly when we move into statutory ICS, we will have a duty to do something about this. But I don't think we should need to have that duty. We, we have it now. We need to get on and, and, and do it. So those are some of the principles uh, um, that, we, that we would like to adopt. And then in terms of some actions, um, it, you know, as I said in my introduction, this is about places putting in actions. Um, so really rooted at place, because that's, that's where there's an understanding in depth of communities and how we might um, do something differently. There's, there's the whole thing around proportionate universalism, which Kath is much better at explaining than I am. So <laughs> I might just ask her to pick that up at the end of the presentation. Um, and we are looking at how we can use our resources better, how we can collectively bring together resources that would help all organisations to um, support actions around health inequalities. So how do we use our public health resource? How do we use our health BI, um, you know, business intelligence resource? How do we harness research and uh, clinical capabilities into helping us with this work? And that's the idea around a unit. We also think that um, uh, training and development of staff in particular around this subject is really important. And we need to learn from COVID. We've learned so much from COVID and we need to take that into all of our work that we do. Um, this link around having an approach to health equity audits in particular that we think are important, particularly when we're looking at commissioning services and looking at service delivery to make sure that we are not um, inadvertently um, not giving true access. So one of the Classic examples of that is the at the moment is the move around digital digital um, services, and we need to make sure that we don't inadvertently um, disadvantage people by moving into that um, arena. And um, as I said earlier, around anchor institutions. So I think that was all I wanted to say. What I'd really like to do today is just get into that conversation. I think that Councillor Dempster. Um, introduced a moment ago which is what do we do in Leicester then as a result of this thank you here we go Mark is there anything that you wanted to add Mark oh, is he there thank you chair uh, so I apologise for being late. I had great difficulty getting on to uh, Zoom. Um, the only thing I would add is, um, first of all, to echo Sarah's remarks, which I think uh, are, are really key. Place is king here. It is at place that people best understand their own populations. And so I, I feel really excited about the opportunity that this offers us all to collaborate based on the understandings that we have of our communities. The final thing to say, I think, is that for me, the most compelling aspect of all of this is the need to take action. It is the need to take action. Fine words are all fine. There's probably nothing there that anybody in the framework that anybody would substantially disagree with. I think our challenge now is to take meaningful, effective, measurable action. And okay, means... lovely. Thank, thanks, Mark. Is there anybody else that wants to comment? Because it, because there's a, there's several there's different bits to this. So the first bit is I'll, I'll open it up to comment. Who is there anybody who wants to comment at this point? Chair, sure, if I may um, uh, agree with the comments from Mark and also some of the points picked up in um, Sarah's presentation. Uh, we seem to be uh, in a cycle of um, revisiting um, health inequalities. Um, and we, you know, we, we have all the data, we are quite data rich, but what seems to be the case is that we don't follow up on the quality aspects, quality of engagement, quality of analysis, looking at what the difference that we can make. Um, and a lot of the communities, um, you know, whether they have, health conditions that are long-term, short-term, um, you know, seem to be not 
getting the information um, that they need to make the choice, you know, in terms of their dignity, their respect, their values, their cultures, um, their dietary lifestyles, etc. And, and I think COVID-19 has just amplified how much of a, a disconnect there is um, in, in that area. So, Sarah, I, I agree wholeheartedly with, wholeheartedly with you that there is a need for training various colleagues across the system, you know, and, and by training, I'm not talking about the Equality Act or, you know, um, uh, about protected characteristic groups. I'm talking about looking at the joint strategic needs assessments, looking at these long term conditions and saying, what, what, what are we actually doing as a health and social care community to work together, share resources, share information and be able to measure the difference? Because, as Mark said, I think the time to talk is over. We now need to take action. Thank you. Lovely. Thanks very much. Uh, any other comments? Or oh, Ivan wants to comment. Um, I do. I want to say thank you very much for the presentation uh, and the work that's been going on with this. I think for me, the, the challenge has been that when we've spoken about health inequalities in the past, it's very much been seen as something that public health will do. So it's, you know, can public health sort out this problem around health inequalities? And I think for years we have been saying, unless we do this collectively, and this was the conversations about wider determinants, because we talk about health inequalities and people talk about the state of their housing. They talk about access to education for their children. They, they, they talk about opportunities uh, and help. It is, these are the things that actually drive it. And because we think that it's, too complicated often what we try to do is, is is corral it down and make it smaller but the reality is we have to tackle this as a big piece of work so that's i just say from a public health point of view i'm delighted that we've got education we've got uhl we've got lpt as health providers but actually we still need to build on planning housing you know um transport all of those areas that we, we are actually going to need to pull in to be able to do this. And that's where I feel the power of the Health and Wellbeing Board, the ICS comes into play. Um, speaking to Sarah and Mark, it's been really interesting speaking to them and then talking about this is now our day job, you know, whether it's UHL or whether it's in the CCG, this is now this has now become part of our day job. And I think that that's a really positive step forward for me. Brilliant. Thank you. Thank you, Ivan. Are there any other comments? I, I, obviously, I've got some things. I always have something to say, don't I? Who from? I can't see. Chair is Rita's hand up hold, and hold Kevin. Hold Rita's. on. David, who else? David, Rita, Kevin. Okay, so we'll have David, Rita, and then Kevin. Thank you. How come I can Thank you. Um, I mean, just to emphasise and underline, this will be absolutely at the heart of the ICS work. And I was delighted to see the document, the fact it had been authored by a wide range of colleagues from different organisations, different perspectives. The encouragement or the um, real push to translate what's in this document into action, I think is something that certainly the ICS will be over, over, overly keen to see happen, both at an ICS, but most importantly, at a place and more local level. So just to sort of position this, locate this in the priorities, it's up there in the Premier League of ICS um, priorities. And I think we're all um, committed to translate this into results and to benefits for local people. My sense is that some things will take some time, but there's no reason why we can't be quite impatient and see action, which we can measure in terms of weeks and months rather than years. And we know there's evidence that that's possible. So let, let's basically get on now between us and get some action taken and some good results. Thank you. Rita. Thank you, Chair. Um, 
I echo a lot of the things that have been said. I have to say that uh, this feels a little bit like a deja vu because we've been around uh, this circuit before. And one of the frank conversations I had with uh, Avai, Councillor Dempster, was what is it that's going to make things different this time? Um, uh, I think communities out there know what the problems that they're facing are in with regards health, but they don't actually see the differences. And Vi tells me that, you know, the, there are new people on the scene. People are committed to wanting to make a difference. We've got uh, a, a, a partnership going that is really wanting to make a step change and wanting to actually not have fine words on paper, but make a difference um, out there. I still have to say the majority of people sitting around this table right now are still white people. And they're still, you know, um, in positions of power where a lot of actually e e people who are marginalized, people from marginalized communities in this city don't even get to uh, uh, voice their concerns. So I think the responsibility is ours. I think Mark is right, but, you know, uh, fine words don't make the difference. Actually, a strategy is only worth anything if we put it into action. The fact that uh, the strategy is going to be a action by the partners, but it's also being accountable to, we're all holding ourselves accountable to this central body, the Health and Wellbeing Board, I think is a really important factor because only then when we discuss the issues, discuss the progress or the lack of progress that we're making. And actually, it's not just about speaking and finding out. As Mukesh has said, we've got a lot of data. We've done a lot of analysis in the past, but it's action and the prioritizing of resources that's really needed. So I would uh, ask that we move on to that stage very, very quickly. We don't spend all our time going out there asking people what are the difficulties that they face. I think we've already got a lot of information on that. I think people are looking for a difference in approach. And so, you know, I'm really hoping that my skepticism can be cast aside. Um, at heart, I'm an optimist. Um, but I have to say, it's really weary having worked for decades and raised issues in different forums for this issue to be addressed. It's really wearing to be around the table again, hoping that this time it's going to be different. Thank you. Yeah, um, and yeah, I can absolutely sympathise with that. I recognise we've had this conversation a number of times and the proof of the pudding is is in the eating, isn't it? And we do need to look at it. Um, I, I, I just want to just clarify one thing, and that is around um, health inequalities. And and I recognise that that class is is not a protected characteristic. But some of um, our uh, greatest challenges are in the west of the city, and some of that. The, that data in terms of, of um, uh, people in the 50s that have um, several um, uh, uh, health issues and um, uh, poor life expectancy are amongst that um, that poor that very poor white working class. So, so th this is an issue ar ar around the, the wide inequalities that's, that's occurring across the city and across the country that we, we definitely need to, to, you know, up our game on. Kevin, you wanted to come in. And then I'm going to go to Mark Whiteman. Thank, thank you, Chair. Thank I, you. I absolutely agree with Councillor Patel. And uh, as, like Councillor Patel, I've been around for a very long time. And I remember back in the health authority days as talking about the lack of resources coming into the city compared to the county and the fact that all the needs were in the city, but the resources were in the county. Um, and so I really welcome this uh, very wonderful management opaque phrase of proportionate univers universalism, which I hope means that in areas of poverty and need and health need, 
there's going to be more resource put in to deliver the universal services um, rather than as, as remain in the um, unequal delivery of um, universalism, which is that everyone gets the same regardless of their need. That's really important that we change this with the ICS. Can I also pick up, uh, yeah, I thought uh, Sarah's point about listening to the people was really, really important as well. Um, that the um, sort of statutory services can save money by listening to the people. They can, they can think of services which um, they think are needed, but actually the people say, no, no, do it this way and you'll get it done better and or cheaper. Um, and it's important that we remember that we're talking about place-based. And if we talk about the city or even the four health need neighborhoods in the city, that people's, people's sense of place is much smaller than that. So it will be critical for us to get much more tightly engaged with communities and people in those communities than, than just doing city-wide stuff. Thank you. To unmute. Sorry. Um, no, Piara, Piara, I'll yeah. bring you in after Mark. Okay. I, I said I'll bring in Mark Whiteman and then Piara. Thank you. Mark? Okay. Um, oh, yeah. Thank you, Councillor, and, and good morning, Councillors and colleagues, and also Hi. thank you. Thank you for the presentation, um, Sarah. So just a couple of thoughts from me, if, if you don't mind. Um, first, just picking up something that Ivan said. So I, I'm from UHR, I'm, I'm the acute provider, we're the, we're the hospital. And, and previously, I think um, I should fess up that hospitals, and it's not unique to Leicester, but hospitals have, have pretty much had operated on the principle that we will treat whoever turns up at our doors and that prevention and inequity in health care and social care for that matter is probably in the remit of public health teams and the commissioners. And that's fundamentally wrong because some of the stuff that we're investigating at the moment belies the fact that actually inequity is structural in the NHS. It's built into our DNA um, as a consequence to the way that some of our systems work. And I'm going to give you a couple of examples of that, if I may, just to bring that point alive. So um, if, you, if you look at, um, at our, what we call DNA rates, which is do not attend rates. So on average, in some of our surgical areas, the do not attend for a first outpatient appointment rate in UHL is something like 7%. So 7% of patients miss, miss their first outpatient appointment. But if you're from a Black and Afro-Caribbean Afro background, you're 50% more likely not to attend your first outpatient appointment. Now, I won't go into the reasons why that might be, but I will say that actually, because we kind of like to think that we follow a kind of um, a universal one size fits all type approach in the NHS, we have a one size fits all discharge policy. So anybody who doesn't attend their first outpatient appointment is discharged back to their GP. <laughs> but the reality is there might be some things underpinning why um, Black African or Black Afro-Caribbean people don't come to their first outpatient appointment. And therefore we should be considering as a health system do we have differential levels of referrals back to GPs that reflects people's lived realities? Now, we've never gone that, that, that way before, and I don't think any, any other acute trust in the country has, but that's the kind of stuff we need to be considering. And equally, if you allow me, access to things like hip and knee operations in the NHS, if you're from a wealthy background, you're four times more likely to get a hip and knee operation. It's called the inverse care law. Whereas if you're from a deprived background, you're probably four times more likely to need a hip or knee operation, but less likely to get it. And if you then overlay the fact that quite a lot of people don't come forward requiring hip and knee operations, if you're a single breadwinner in a kind of poor household and you have to take a, a, a month off work as a consequence yeah. of recovery, then you might be dis disinclined to have that operation. You might put it off and put it off until it becomes a critical thing affecting your employment and those those are the things i mean about structural inequity if we don't take those things into consideration not least for example when we're listing people for surgery then we're probably missing some of the point but in a health system that's based on bevan's kind of equity for all based on your um access uh, your, your, based on your kind of uh, need rather than your ability to pay 
we kind of think that's that's all that covered off, but it's not. We need to get under the skin of, okay, if you are from a very deprived background, you've never had a sense of entitlement for anything, we need to factor that into some of our decision making, right from primary care through to when people are on the operating table. Um, so I'm sorry, that's a bit of a, a bit of a soapbox, but no, that's where the absolutely. acute trust is going, is, is trying to think, okay, how do we bring deprivation, ethnicity, some of the things that we know affect a patient's outcomes and access yeah. into, into hospital. And we're in the foothills, if I'm absolutely honest. Great. Thanks. Thanks, Mark, though. Really important points. So I'm going to go to Piara and then Catherine. And then Thank, Harsha. Uh, Thank you, Chair. Uh, obviously, you know, uh, this is really a good report, and uh, we are here to discuss today health inequality. I just want to check and raise some of my observations, what we have learned through this COVID-19 uh, from last March till today. Which are those communities and section of our community was affected the most. Which section was actually affected in more hospital admissions, death rate, and which section of the community is reluctant to take up vaccination? Whether this is a health inequality like obesity, heart, diabetes, whether it's the concentration of the area and the population in which they live, whether it's a terrace properties or inner city area or some part of outer state, where family are in a habit of gregarious nature of their living together as a family unit, mm -hmm. which actually unable them to isolate, whether there is a lack of sort of now open space in the vicinity where they could have gone out for exercise, whether it's deprivation, unemployment or poverty affects them all, whether it's awareness, whether the lack of exercise and their lack of active lifestyle. So whether it is the habit of their eatings, like you know, what sort of diet, requirement, what sort of you know, uh, food they eat, how we can reach out those section of the community, what we have learned from this COVID-19, which come very sort of you now afferent. It is not only Leicester, what we have learned from other city where most of black ethnic Asian community live city like Birmingham, Coventry, city like now even Derby, part of Nottingham, and but some area of London in the same way was affected more than others. Far north, like now, you know, many area uh, in, like Blackburn and others. So obviously, you know, this is something we need to look back and how we address that. There are some health inequality affecting people the most in a very different way. So obviously, you know, these are things you now which remind me that you now we need to do some more. We need to reach out to those section of the community, what we have learned and how we want mm -hmm. to actually you know, work with them. Thank you, Chair. Thank, thanks, Piara. And I, I've got no doubt at all that many of the universities up and down the country are going to be doing that, that piece of work. And one of the things that's going to be, I think, quite important is that we get some, well, certainly for me, if nobody else, um, some easy, easy read versions um, of that research so that we can use that to inform uh, the work that we're going to be doing um, moving forward. And, and the other aspect is when we come on to the next agenda item around engagement, um, those issues are, are absolutely critical. So then we come on to Catherine and then Harsha and Martin and Sarah, and then I'm going to be bringing it to a close. 
Okay, so Catherine first, if people can can be succinct. Thank you. Thank you, Chair. Uh, one uh, point linked to what Mark was saying, um, there's building evidence in terms of research studies that show that deprivation is linked to hospital outcomes. So for example, a recent study showed that people from the more deprived communities did worse uh, after and during and after elective um, planned operations. So mm. it's, it's, it has an impact on outcomes substantially um, from hospital outcomes as well. I just wanted to pick up on proportionate universalism because it's got mentioned a few times. I appreciate that the term is a bit of jargon, uh, jargon based. Uh, so Michael Marmot, who's um, big in the area of health inequalities, did a report in 2010 about reducing health inequalities and he introduced, he and his team introduced the term in that report and it's to do with resourcing <laughs> also delivering services, universal services, but are, are, are proportionate to need. Uh, so that might be resource being proportionate to need, but also the type of services being delivered, being proportionate to need. So taking into account, for example, that people from more deprived communities need greater input to reach the same level of diabetic control, for example. So I just wanted to summarise what it is, because I know it's a bit of a funny term, uh, but just to explain for people. Great. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Catherine. Let's move on then to Harsha and then Martin, Sarah, and then I'll bring it to a close. Thank you. Okay. Harsha. Thank you. Uh, so I'm not going to go back to some of the things that have already been mentioned because I do al already agree with that. The, the one thing that I wanted to say was we need to make sure that the 11 and up the services and that what we do doesn't in itself create an inequality in terms of access or, or anything else. So just, just to be mindful of that. I know as part of this putting this strategy together, Health Watch has been involved in the task and finish group that we're looking at it. So some of these comments have already been made, but just a reminder to colleagues that we don't want a strategy that then creates more inequality just by <coughs> its sheer existence. Thank okay, you. thanks. Thanks for that, that Harsha. It's very, very helpful reminder. Martin. Thank you. Uh, apologies for uh, joining the, me the meeting slightly late. I, I just wanted to, to note that. Can course, you can uh, you just move your mic? Uh, see, can you hear me now? <laughs> yeah. Um, so so uh, so just wanted to yeah we, we we focused on perhaps some of the issues in in the health world but I think of course we we need to recognise that that applies just as much in the the social care and education world that that although perhaps as, as, as services, we tend to pride ourselves on the way that we, we are open and, and, and accessible to, to everyone. We do know that many services do to get used much more um, by, by some groups that, that, than others, that, that the, the, the inverse care law can apply just as strongly in, in social care and education as it does um, anywhere else. So, so we have been taking forward some work of, of real real critical self-examination looking looking at the data challenging ourselves and saying well actually are are we delivering services uh, in in ways that are equitable that do genuinely uh, provide access to, to, to everyone according to their need according to their context rather than saying well um, everyone can access us in the same way so if some people don't then that's 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 their issue and we've also then I'm picking up the, the uh, a couple of the other points that have been made earlier that this issue about um, participation and recognizing that that engagement it can be a very limited thing and that therefore um, the need to move beyond just simply engagement to, to genuine co-production and participation and, and um, um, members of the board may may well be aware of the work that we've done with the Lundy model uh, which is uh, actually getting some some um, international recognition about Leicester being the first local authority in the country which is adopting this this model which is a rights-based uh, participation model uh, uh, supported and, and, and promoted by the UN by, by a number of international organisations but it does give a very different approach and a very different way of thinking about how we how we connect with the people that we we serve and that the the, the fundamental importance of of doing that that it's not it's not just us as as professionals who know what who know what to do and can, can tell people but actually it is a, a a process of participation where people have rights and we are genuinely listen to them so there's a long way still to go but there is some some progress that we're making on this thank you 
Thank, thanks, Martin. Sarah, Councillor Russell. Thank you. Um, I'll be really quick. Um, so a couple of things. Um, first of all, I love the stuff around proportional universalism. Um, I think having been been well trained on it by Deb Watson and, and she always used to explain it around our um, our smoking cessation model. That was my first experience of proportional universalism and how we applied that in the city. And we've certainly applied it in a range of ways, looking at, um, at some of our, our early access stuff, children's social care, et cetera. And I think um, the early help side is, is really key on that. But the other thing I wanted to pick up was around the links between this and, and Vi made the point really clearly around actually what what um, what economic situation people are in has a huge impact on this. And the I'm, I'm offering at some point, if we want to have a look at some of the anti-poverty stuff, data stuff that we've been looking at and how it crosses over, um, that might give a different um, lens into this. Um, so it's, it's a future offer if, if people wanted it, but it allows us to look at that sort of broader lens, looking at housing, um, employment types um, and a range of other issues and and there may be other ways that people want to sort of cross-section this because I think we have to absolutely have this recognising where the health inequalities are but actually where other broader inequalities are as well and how they intersect with one another and how by tackling the more, one area we can have a positive impact on another so I'll give a really quick example and then finish um, um, make helping people get access to debt advice at the earliest possible opportunity will not only help them financially and maintain their home and all the other things, but will mean that rather than not opening the mail when the GP or the hospital appointment comes and therefore missing the appointments, because people will no longer be scared to open the mail, you get a positive impact because people then feel able to engage with health services and make those phone calls and other things. The two are inextricably linked. And I think the more we can do that recognises one can benefit the other, um, the better we can all, um, better impact we will all be able to have. Absolutely. Thank, thanks, Sarah, for that, for that offer. And I'm sure that's something that in the future we'll want to take up because it is, it is you know, one of the cornerstones of this whole, this whole issue going forward. Now, on the basis that one of the things I really, really struggle with is going to meetings and then there's no outcomes. Um, I, I suppose maybe I'll be a little bit, um, I don't like to think of myself as bossy, but, um, so we've done the commenting on the framework. Can I just say that we, can I take it that we all endorse the principles of this approach that's contained in the framework? Could everybody just stick the hand up if they um, support the principles of the approach? Yes? Is everybody doing that? Yes? Okay, so I, I think that we've got agreement for that one. So that's, that's good, yeah? But what does that actually mean in practice? So can I just say a couple of things? The first thing is, is this, that we have got um, a joint health and wellbeing strategy, and now we've also got this document. One of the things that I think that could be done reasonably quickly is that we, and Ivan, could you just come in on this? That we, we simply um, relook at our existing action plan and build on that and this document. Ivan, do you think that's possible? Not, yeah, not only is it possible, it's absolutely the right thing that we should do. Hey. Uh, and I think we, we sort of had a conversation between Mark, Sarah and myself and I know that we want to do some work around development sessions. This would be the perfect time to utilize the framework, utilize our, our health and wellbeing strategy, and then engage with some of those partners that we spoke about in relation to planning, housing, transport, all of those areas to see how then now we make this real. So, so I would suggest that we go offside try and pull some of this together, but then have a development session with partners, education, et cetera, um, to, to look at how we, that, what does that mean in practical ways? Okay, 
So do I have agreement to that proposal as outlined by Ivan? If so, raise your hand. <laughs> Excellent. Thank you. The other thing that I'm trying to do in the council is to to move us, to move public health, to be right at the very centre of everything that we do in the council. And so I wonder how many of you could go back to your organisations and you could say to your organisation, let's have, and, and I'm sorry, I always struggle with this, proportionate <laughs> universalism, <laughs> let's have this at the heart of every single thing that we do. And I would like to see you all go back to your organisation and, and ask for that commitment. Now, I'm not going to ask people to, to have a show of hands here. I'm simply going to ask you that you, you see if you can do that. OK? Um, because I think it is absolutely crucial. It is absolutely crucial. Public health, NHS... It is a universal service. We all understand that, but it has to be proportionate to need. Otherwise, we are never going to be able to, um, to move things forward. So um, before I just uh, continue, um, Azar um, um, had to um, come into the meeting late, and therefore on that basis, I'm going to give him the opportunity to speak. Azar, what... What can we do? Yeah, <clears throat> thank, thank you very much, Vi. Can you hear me okay? We can, thank I'm you. I'm rubbish at IT. I couldn't get into Zoom, so I managed oh, to. Oh, bless you. I can't find a hands-up function anywhere. So that's oh, what... you see, you're <laughs> anyway, as bad as me. Th th thank you. Yeah, probably, probably, probably worse. Um, yeah. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> on the uh, proportionate universalism, uh, yes, the NHS certainly has signed up and the CCGs are committed, so... And it'd be great if all the other partners can do likewise. So no issue there. In terms of making this a reality, um, and I think this is both from the NHS and other partners, local authority, health and wellbeing board perspective. One of the things proposed in the paper, if I'm uh, if I joined for the right paper, that is, is uh, a health and equality support unit, uh, which is proposed as one of the actions. Uh, and this, certainly from the NHS perspective, will be really, really useful because we get so busy designing pathways and designing services that quite often either we don't have the expertise or we don't have the prompts to really look at health inequalities from the get-go. So the idea of this sort of support unit, which I know I've discussed with Ivan, uh, and he's supportive of it, I think, is really to, to uh, go to somewhere where they can have access to the best evidence, uh, the best way to implement uh, health inequalities, the best data, local data and so on. So right from the beginning when we're planning services, either in the NHS or jointly with the, with the um, uh, partners like the local authority, we can have that information and make sure that we implement it. So uh, that's just something, if you haven't discussed it, might be worth touching on. Uh, bye. Thank you. Thank you, Asa. And I think that's that's one of the issues then that we could take up at the development session. Yes, Ivan. Okay. So we do have some some um, for the, for the minutes. So we've um, endorsed the principles. We have agreed that we are going to be having a development session, and it's really important that, <clears throat> that you know that that people. Uh, the right people in the organisations attend that development session um, because that's where we actually get to the nitty gritty about the concrete. So what? How are we going to move this forward? What does it look like? Who is going to do what within what time scale? And that is absolutely critical. We've also got this issue um, of, of agreement that people are going to go back to their individual organisations and discuss the, the issue around proportionate universalism. And the last thing that I would, I would say to people is around this issue of having um, inequality and, and health um, as one of the cornerstones of, of everything that they do no matter whether you're here from the university or, or whatever institution you're here from, 
you should be in every decision that you're making, you should be thinking around health and um, health inequalities. Um, so I think that that is it in terms of actions. The most important action really is the fact that we have got this agreement. And I know that it's, it's really, you know, it, it, it gets, you know, fed up. People get fed up having the same discussions all the time. But we just have to say we've drawn a line under everything that's happened before and we're moving on. I feel really confident in the people that we've got around the table and the, the commitment from all the organisations in our city. And um, hopefully... We'll be, we'll be driving forward. And I feel quite confident about that. So I'm looking forward to the development session. And thank you all very much, particularly thanks to um, Sarah and Mark for, for the presentation um, and also to, to Catherine, early days, but for the work that, that, you, that you will be doing um, together. So thank you very much. So can we move on then to another very, very important issue, and that is this issue about engagement. And, you know, people can say, well, people might feel engaged to death. But there is something for me about maybe one of the reasons that we've not made the progress over the years is because we continually engage with the same people in the same way. And maybe we have to start to think about engaging differently, um, picking up on that point from Kevin about um, <coughs> getting right down that, that people's sense of place maybe isn't the same as, as ours. And I mean, one of the biggest issues, I mean, that, that just in the last week, I think, highlighted that was the fact that we've had the, um, the vaccination centre, haven't we, at the People Centre? And we've just moved it to um, a pop-up one, to St Matthew's. And, and I, I think that we'll find a lot, a lot better take-up um, by doing that. And yeah, it's literally... A matter of hundreds of yards but it's it's it is quite interesting people's sense of place and how and how major roads um can affect their their sense of place so um there's lots and lots of work to be done and um i actually sent board members a letter um i hope you all remember um and i'm asking <clears throat> you for some verbal updates about <clears throat> engagement activity. So um, without um, wasting a lot more time, I'd like to invite some updates from, from each organisation. Who, who wants to go first? Stick your hand up. Kevin? Your hand's up. Do you want to go first? Kevin Routledge. Yes, apologies. That was a leftover hand up from the. All right. Okay. <laughs> well, what, what what I do want to, what I did want to say, as you know, I'm representing the professional uh, sports clubs, and uh, we meet regularly as a group. Not as much in COVID. Um, the importance of what we do in terms of physical activity. Uh, as it as it impacts overall health is is clearly uh, something that's relevant to this discussion. We, we've been having, uh, and we don't claim to have the expertise of the people sitting on on this board, uh, but we do want to help. And in our last discussion, uh, we were talking about engagement, our traditional forms of engagement how they've been impacted by COVID. But one of the things that occurred to us in those discussions was, I, I know COVID has impacted everything and it's impacted this discussion and it's proved an immense challenge which should never be underestimated. But we wondered as well, 
whether it's also created an opportunity. In the sense that it's redefined how people interface with health, whether that's a hospital, A&E, a GP, or any other service that they get at a local health center. That has been transformed and the demand has changed. And we were wondering whether that will all return to normal. COVID has squeezed out everything and then COVID is disappearing. Will, will the way people engage revert back to the normal or will, has there been a transformational change? In other forums, we've had heard discussions about, oh, you know, why are people going, utilizing services, people who don't need to be there. Uh, you know, the typical old lady who goes around to see her doctor, fills up the surgery, says, I've got a pain in my toe. She actually wants somebody to talk to her. Maybe that's been squeezed out. And we, we thought, you know, there was mention earlier about we need action. We wondered whether there is, because of this change, the squeezing out of the normal. Now, I'm sure there's built up heart problems and other uh, health problems, but we, we just wondered actually now, or as we come out of COVID, more of society opens up, whether we should be doing something short term uh, to recognize the demand on the total system has fundamentally changed. So I don't know that it's particularly relevant to what you just were talking about, Councillor, but it was something that we felt that we should be asking the question in the appropriate forum in order to guide what we do in terms of the work of our foundations as people come back off furlough. Thanks, Kevin. I think that's a really important point. And again, that, that's something that if we make a note and we pick that up in the, in the development session um, moving forward. Thank you for that. Now I'm going to go to Martin, Kevin and Cathy. Okay, thank you. Um, so I just uh, wanted to talk a little bit about the work, um, going back to, the, to this issue of engagement, I wanted to talk a little bit about the work that we've been doing with the, uh, the participation strategy and drawing in on the, uh, the, the model produced by Professor Laura Lundy as, as, a, as a dramatically different way of connecting with, with young people. Uh, and, and, uh, and I have to say, you know, in, in all the years I've worked in the public service, I, I don't think I've ever seen a group of people so excited and enthused by the very different approach that this that this brings. And, and I think for, um, I think for me, one of the things that really stands out is because it's a rights based model. You know, the, these are the human rights of the people we are that, that we are we are serving that we are working with. It's not um, our choice as to whether we should engage or participate with them. It is their it is their fundamental right that they should have a voice in what happens about them, and that that switching um, uh, that approach has has been really quite dramatic in terms of the 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 atmosphere and the culture that that's had uh, across ch uh, children's services. Really, uh, I think you're know, getting getting people very excited about a, a new way of working with young people, and so I mean. You, 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 you posed some questions in your in your letter, so if I can very briefly go go through those. So um, you asked about the, the the opportunities and the innovative methods of engagement that we that we'd used. So we we were able to run a full um, public consultation on the new the new approach, uh, despite the fact that we were. Uh, in lockdown and and uh, working through uh, remote working, uh, we were very active on on social media. Uh, we had daily polls on different elements of the new model. We had an online consultation. We had a, a whole series of virtual uh, focus groups, uh, focus group sessions, and a number of webinars. And I think a key element of that was the the wide range of social media approaches that that we were we were connecting with people, with young people, in the ways that they chose to be connected with not in the ways necessarily that we would normally have have done that uh, and so um we did we did recognize that there were there were, were, were challenges in that and so one of the things that we had to do was that we had to to spend a lot of staff time supporting children and young people to m make sure that they had they had access to devices that they were uh, able to uh, to meet with with people in private using 
uh, using the online uh, the online tools uh, that we <coughs> recognize some of the challenges about privacy when you have to have someone supporting you with the IT. So it was a real a real um, real lessons learned for us in terms of, of how people were able to access and, and, and to connect. And I think that it it also brought out um, very strongly often the, the question of the mental health of the young people. That you know, It has been an incredibly difficult year for many young people and that we've had to uh, we've had to learn much more effectively how to judge where people's mental health is because we, we're often having to do it online in a virtual context rather than being face to face with them and to, and to understand the, the, the pressures that there have been on, on, on the young people. So we, we've tried to mitigate some of those, those issues about uh, digital exclusion and the question about whether people were being, their voices were being heard by uh, making sure that, uh, that we had uh, that people did have access to, to, to equipment and that they were able to, uh, to, to use it. Um, and then we, we recognised that, that many young people really didn't want to use um, Microsoft Teams or, or Zoom or, or any of those. These just weren't tools that, that spoke to them. So um, we instead did a number of activities through Facebook Live. And actually, we found that that was a, a much more accessible route. It was it was a, a tool that, that young people wanted to use. And again, that's been a, you know, moving us away from our perhaps slightly hidebound uh, official ways of doing things and responding much more. But I think the, the key things we've learned is, is actually that children can be far more resilient than we might give them credit for when they're faced with these un, un, unprecedented challenges, that actually our our sense of risk about digital engagement and, and particularly about social media, um, we, we were probably being overcautious and that actually we can use it safely, that people do respond well to social media and, and that, they'll, that they'll use technology if it's technology they're already using. And it's something about us bending to them rather than expecting them to bend to us. So, so it's been a, a, a huge learning experience for us. And, and the fact that I, as I've, I don't think I've ever come across a, a, such something which has excited people in the way that this has. It, it's, it's really striking a chord in the team. Yeah? And, and, it's, uh, and, and, and what's, what was particularly encouraging is that uh, we, had a, we had a session with Professor Lundy herself uh, earlier in the week. And actually mm -hmm. she was commenting how, how the work that we're doing in Leicester really is an exemplar that you know, she, in, in her international work, she is frequently referring to Leicester and the work that we're doing. So we've got an awful lot to learn, but, but I think we, we have learned a lot already and, and it, it is that different okay. approach to, to engagement. So thank you. Thanks, Martin. Perhaps we, you could um, circulate if you, whatever you have. Hmm. It's actually you're ri written up. You could actually circulate that to board members. Hmm. Be very happy. Yeah, to. that would be yeah. that would be good. We, I mean, I mean, I have to say that, um, you know, one of one of my real concerns, not just in terms of of young people, but in in terms of the people of all ages in the city, is about how we engage. Um, the, the hard to reach groups mm. as they're as they're called and and one of the things that I was thinking just as a as a brief example is that um in Beaumont Lees the police and crime commissioner um has um funded some um detached youth workers and they go out and they are engaging with some you know some some young people who are right on the, the margins of, of you know difficulties with society um and it's about how we can work with them um to to perhaps engage with these young people around um what are the issues for them in terms of accessing our sexual health services etc cetera, etc cetera. Mm. um so it is about who we are actually connecting with that is is as much a concern for me um, as as how we're doing it. So Kevin, then Kathy, then Mark. Kevin. Yes, thank you, Chair. Um, our engagement at Val is is around what I would call the organised public. Um, so people who have come together and coalesced, whether it be around a place, a, an issue, or a service. So people like the Emerald Centre with the Irish Community or Shama Women's Centre in, in Highfields or Be Inspired working in, in Braunston. Um, but quite a lot of those groups that we work with are very, very small. So something like 90% of the 1,500 or so groups in the city um, only operate on a few hundred pounds, if that, a, a year. So they're very committed volunteers 
that we're supporting, some of whom are very ex- expert in their field. Um, so a bit, you know, a lot like Martin, you know, the challenge of the last year has been how to reach these people, how to reach these groups through this um, uh, disastrous pandemic. Um, and, you know, we've been set, pun- pumping out information through weekly newsletters. We've reshaped our websites, put everything online. So our, our annual conference this year was over three days entirely online. Um, but we've also done things with um, service users. So we've got services with people with learning disabilities and we fundraised and um, put out Facebook portals to individuals so they could reconnect into support um, that they were missing to make sure those services um, kept going. Um, so it's, it's, it's a variety of things we've had to do, but it is back to this organised public that we engage with. So it's a bit like if you're an employer, you might talk directly to your workforce, but you might also engage with the trade union. Um, so a lot of the groups we work with are in effect the trade unions of the public uh, in either localities or around specific services. OK, thanks, Kevin. Cathy. <coughs> Good morning, everybody. I'm Hi, Cathy. I'm Chair of Leicestershire Partnership Trust, and we provide mental health and community. Hi, Hi. can you hear me? Yes. Mm. Can you hear me OK? Yes. You, you keep dropping out, but yes, can hear you now. Can you hear me? Yeah. OK, I'll, I'll try and talk. Yeah. So um, just picking up on your point about how we do engagement differently, uh, there are two things that we've set up in the last year in Leicestershire Partnership Trust. One is our People's Council, which we created in September 2020. It's chaired by Mark Farmer of Healthwatch, and it consists of patients, carers, and voluntary and community organisations. We also have a really diverse representation of protected characteristics on the People's Council. They're there really to hold us to account to ensure that we deliver on our patient engagement strategy. And they came along to our trust board meeting last month to talk about their priorities. The first one was uh, how they support our refresh of our step up to great strategy. And secondly, about our mental health services. And I know Gordon will talk a bit more about this later on the agenda. The second area, we've done a lot of work building on what Martin said about young young people. We've set up a youth advisory board, which has 10 active members on it, aged from 13 to 21. And they meet on a weekly basis to help us provide insight on our services. Some examples of things that they've done for us, they've been mystery shoppers on our chat health text messaging service. They've also had a critical look at our Health for Teens website and helped us enhance that in particular areas they thought they needed to. And also during lockdown, they did some 10 second tips, uh, short films that were on Twitter to sort of inspire other people of their age, uh, you know, to comply with social distancing requirements, but also how to how to keep engaged during the lockdown. So. I think we've had a really different approach this year and all of all of the people on the People's Council and the Youth Advisory Board have been supported by training and development from, from our trust. So hopefully that's helpful. Great. Thanks, Cassie. Mark. Hi. Hi again, and, and thank you. So I'll give you a couple of examples of what we're doing at the moment on, on engagement and then a couple of thoughts on what we might do in the future. So as recently as last night, Colleagues from across the health system, including our clinical teams, were on a Facebook Live um, event talking about vaccines and vaccine hesitancy and people's natural worries about having a vaccine. And I think at last count, that had reached somewhere in the region of 6,000 people, which is really good. From the pure hospital's point of view, as you know, we're building a children's hospital. We're not going to build it without listening to the voices of children's and par- children and parents. Otherwise, we'll probably end up doing it wrong. So we're um, listening to um, kids and their parents about what their aspirations for a modern children's hospital looks like. But we've also been reflecting that actually, and those two two are really good examples of what I'm about to say, that whenever the, almost whenever public sector organisations engage, they engage with an agenda. And I was reminded of what Councillor Sangster said at a recent meeting where she was basically re- retelling the story of one of her constituents 
who was talk, being talked about about the vaccine and was essentially saying, we well, haven't bothered about me for years. Why are you suddenly bothered about me now? In other words, because it was on our agenda on vaccine hesitancy, then suddenly we want to engage with these people. And it made me think, actually, we need to invert the way we engage with people and go out there without an agenda. Yeah. And that brings me to my last point, which is really, you know what, whether it's the city council housing department, UHL's emergency department, GPs in surgery, we're all kind of talking to the same people or trying to. So engagement, patient public involvement is hard work. It's time intensive and you need to do it properly. And I'm just wondering how much better we'd be if we just said, actually, sod this, let's let's pull some of our resources as public sector agencies and say, yep. what does a city or a lesser lesser than Rutland community engagement resource look like? And we do it through the lens of health, social care, education, housing, whatever. I think we get more bangs for our bucks that way. Yeah. Uh, uh, well, thank you, Mark. Not only would, get, would we get more bang for a box, but the bottom line is the communities might, might want to engage but because they're not fed up getting bombarded by different people wanting to engage with them because that's an issue. You know, one minute it's UHL, then it's... It's public health, then it's then it's whatever, and you just think, well, you all just go away, you know, you know. Um, so I, I, I think I think you've got a real important point there, Ivan. Could you perhaps yeah. pick up on that point from Mark? Because uh, I think it's absolutely critical. I was about to say that Mark really just took away what I was about to say, actually. Um, no, which is good because we're seeing the same thing. So I was going to talk about engagement through the lens of COVID which has meant that we haven't had long engagement documents. We haven't put it necessarily through our organisations to do engagement, but we've had to be swifter for and just go and speak to people. And, and, and we've been doing that quite a lot for a whole range of reasons. So I'm not going to go through all of that, but I am going to pick up two things that, that have come to me through doing this process that makes us to think about engagement again. Uh, the, the first one was when you find the right people they will pull the right teams together the people that you talk to not the usual suspects so I think of some of the work that we had done with with the black community some of the work that we've done with Somalian communities etc we we found a couple of people in fact we were approached by a couple of people because why don't we do engagement the wrong way around they came and spoke to us and said can you come and have a conversation mm -hmm. with our organization and initially we were talking about COVID but actually, you can't do effective engagement without trust. And I just realized that unless we get the trust issue sorted, yeah. the engagement becomes meaningless. Yeah. So we ended up having a conversation about COVID, but then it led into conversations that were far much more about mental well-being. It was a lot more about young people. Uh, and I just thought, well, actually, my job really is to take that on behalf of us, of us all. So that, that's the first thing, you've got to have trust. And secondly, we've got to push away some of the boundaries, which is UHL are consulting, LPT are consulting, yeah. local authority are consulting. consulting. But actually when we pick up things, I should be able to go to Kathy, I should be able to go to Mark. I should say, look, we did this exercise. I was talking about weight management, but the big thing that came out of it was actually, I can't get into the hospital or I can't just do this without you guys having to go back again. So I think we need to be a lot more fluid around our boundaries. And that point that Mark just made about, maybe we should just think about how we talk to people collectively around their issue without it being across subjects. I think that really came out quite strongly with, with the responses that I've, I've been involved with. Great. Thanks, Ivan. OK, Richard, Rita, Sarah. Richard? Morning, Councillor Dempster. Um, Hi, Richard. Hi. Uh, so I, I guess what I would say, I think it picks up actually a lot of what colleagues have just been talking about over the last few minutes. So uh, from a CCG perspective, I guess our reflection of the last 12 months would be that one size doesn't fit all. And actually what you need to have is a range of different approaches and techniques 
no one community is the same. They all want slightly different things. So you need to have a dynamic model which is able to adapt to the needs and requirements of particular groups and communities. Um, from a CCG NHS perspective, one of the things that we've done over the course of the last year or so has put in place what we call a patient public involvement assurance group. Um, that's a group of individuals who effectively um, challenge and test the quality of our patient and public involvement, um, make sure that we're on the right lines and having the right conversations with the right kinds of people. Similar to what Cathy was describing, we've also developed uh, what we call a citizens panel, which is a group of around about a thousand people at the moment who are demographically representative across LLR at system level, who we can use as effectively a kind of rapid testing mechanism on a range of different issues. And they've proved to be really valuable actually at giving us quick insights into what public perception is around a broad range of issues. I think in terms of some of our other engagement activity, um, clearly the last 12 months has necessitated that we've had to do a lot more of our engagement online. Um, in some ways, although there are obviously barriers around online engagement, I think it's also fair to say that it's enabled us to engage with people who never would have engaged with us previously using some of the traditional mechanisms. You know, we've definitely seen a different type of person who has attended some of our online engagement events who never would have come to a physical face-to-face -face type meeting. The challenge is, is how do we make sure that in doing that, we just don't shift to having a conversation with a new group of people and leave behind those people who are not digitally enabled and have traditionally engaged with us. And I think that that's where the voluntary and community sector um, and some of our partners um, in, in communities and faith um, cells particularly is really important. So what we've been doing is whilst we've been engaging fairly extensively online, We've also been trying to work with the voluntary sector, the community sector, um, faith and community leaders to make sure that they are also having open conversations with us, with people who might not be digitally enabled to make sure that they are able to have their voices heard. Uh, I just want to pick up on something that Mark said, because I really strongly agree with this actually, and this is very much the direction of travel for the CCGs. We've, over the course of the last six to 12 months, completely turned our engagement model on its head. So typically what the NHS does when it comes to engaging is somebody comes up with a great idea, normally a manager or a clinician, a load of work is done on that in a darkened room. It gets to the point where it's largely a finished product. And then we go out and engage with the public and say, we've got this brilliant idea. What do you think folks? And typically what they do is they go, well, that's bonkers, isn't it? That might work for you but it makes no sense to me as the person that's actually using this service. So what we're trying to do is rather than engaging with people on issues at a point when it's too late for people to be able to really make a difference, is doing exactly what Mark and Ivan were describing, which is having communications with people which are much more open and much more based around place to understand what it is that's important to people and building up real evidence and insight about what it is that people are concerned about bringing that back into the CCG and into the NHS and actually using that to inform what the strategy development is. So trying to spin the model completely on its head. At that point, I think it gives us a much stronger hope of being able to go back out to communities and say, you told us that this is an issue you were worried about. This is what we're now doing about it. This is how we're responding. Um, and then I think it also opens up the opportunity for us to be able to do much more co-production in which service users and those people with lived experience are able to be part of um, developing the actual solutions themselves. So I guess in a, in a summary, Councillor Dempster, that's, that's kind of the headlines, I guess. I'm on mute. Sorry. Thank you. That's brilliant. So Rita and Sarah... And then I'm going to move on. Thank you. Thanks, Vi. <clears throat> Thanks. Um, uh, I have to say, um, just listening to people talk about building trust and, uh, uh, you know, approaching, talking to communities in a different way really inspires confidence in me because I think for the first time, different people uh, in different organisations are coming to the same conclusion from... Uh, based on their own journeys and they finding different solutions for it. I do like 
the, uh, uh, some of the things that Ivan and um, uh, Mark said about maybe having some kind of a central resource. One of the things that we fail to do in our organizations is um, uh, have a library of information about what we're learning as we're going along, what works, what doesn't work, or maybe, you know, the kind of strategies that uh, uh, inform our future development. And we, we are very good at going through processes. We're not very good at depositing the outcomes and the learning from those processes in a central, for, as a central resource for anybody in the city to access, for organizations to access. So I think, you know, the uh, uh, suggestion that Mark made about maybe what we need is a central resource of some kind, you know, maybe we pull our resources together and start having this dialogue on the, uh, this, um, uh, uh, building trust with our communities. So we talk to them about a whole myriad of things and we take a holistic approach to stuff. May, maybe we need to really look at that seriously, but even if we decide to go uh, and do it individually in our own uh, individual organizational ways, maybe we still need to find a way of po pooling the learning together so that we each one of us can draw from each other's learning um, as and when we need to. And also we have that as a deposit, uh, a repository for people in the future um, who may face similar kinds of issues. So I think this is great. Thank you, Vahi. Great, thanks Rita. And lastly, Sarah. Yep, yeah, two really quick things from me. Um, the first um, really builds on, on Rita's point, and it's going to sound slightly negative, and I absolutely don't mean it to be, um, is around learning lessons. And this isn't the first time we've looked at how can we jointly do stuff around community involvement and engagement. Um, I'm not sure who else on the call will remember, but I'm fairly certain Vi will remember some cracking work that was done in New Parks some 10-ish uh, years ago where we had joint work between health, the council and the police, going out and talking to residents on a regular basis and really understanding their issues and planning services on the back of that. And it was a brilliant piece of work, but I don't think financially it was sustainable and, and therefore it fell away. And, and we've got that, that we have to recognise that some communities we have tried this with before, so we've, there will be a level of resistance. But also let's learn what worked well from that. You know, what did we get out of it that was really good? How did people engage positively? You know, let's let's take on where we've done well at this before, because we have done well at it at times. We don't always do well and we very rarely do well consistently, but we do have moments of brilliance between us all. And let's grab those and see if we can carry them on. Um, and the other bit, and I, I just I don't I'm struggling slightly with phrasing on this, but I think we need to be careful and understand consciously the difference between engaging with um, communities and engaging with geographical areas. And the two are different and the ways of approaching them are different and both are important for different reasons. Mm -hmm. And I think being really clear, if we're engaging with um, a community, I'll use our Polish community in the city, which actually isn't a single community. There's a new community and an old Polish community. So actually that in itself is, is a point to make so understanding who you're wanting to engage with and are you trying to engage with them as a um as a, a a national or a religious or a racial community or are you trying to engage with a specific geography and when we're looking at service planning both of those matter so i think for me there is some clarity around that when we when we're approaching things really understanding what is it we're trying to do and who is it we're trying to talk to is key from the outset. Otherwise, I think we can end up muddying that and then people get cross with us because people will say, well, we communicate, we I'll use our Polish community again. We we consulted widely in, in Westcoats and Foss. And people will rightly say, yeah, but that isn't where all of our community lives and that our community has changed. And there is something about mm -hmm. that recognition of both, I think. So yeah. That would be yeah, ab absolutely. Just interesting that you say that. I, I'm a governor at Barleycroft School, which is in Beaumont Lees. Polish, I think, is our third biggest language. Um, so you're absolutely, you're absolutely right on that. Okay. Now, um, you know, I'm sure that we could talk for the rest of the meeting about this matter, but we have yet another. Um, very, very important item on the agenda. So before we move on to that, if I could just sum up, because again, um, 
you know, the issue is we've had, I, I'm not being funny, we've had, a, I think we've had a great discussion. The things that I've heard around um, building trust, um, engaging without necessarily having a, a an all singing, all dancing proposal, um, central resource, co-production, um, we've got a number of different youth advisory boards. Um, I, all of this stuff, I think, is really good. The issue for me is how do we pull it together? So I've got a proposal. The report that we had earlier around um, um, inequalities, our health inequalities framework, which gives the, um, the outline and it gives then some key principles. I think that, that we should do the same piece of work for engagement. I don't think it's a massive piece of work. I think it can be done by the time of the next meeting, Ivan. Um, and I think that that then can give us something, it can give us principles that we can all work to because it's really important that we're not all constantly reinventing the wheel or well, at least that's that's my opinion Ivan would you want to comment on that yes I think I think for me it's we've got some real expertise around here you know we've spoken mm. to Richard we've spoken to Mark and, and Kathy and it would be trying to pull plug those key elements to say look this is what we're all going to do we're going to start bottom up not top down you know those things that we've captured here now we can capture those in a kind of um start of ten and circulate it to uh, the different organizations but it would be something that we'd want you to to build on but, you know you've got you've got people that are experts around engagement and and have experienced quite a lot over the course of the last 12 months to build on so We'd, we'd be happy to make a start on it if that helps. Ivan, that's really helpful. Would would that be agreeable to the board that that um, we in in health in the city will start this piece of work? We'll we'll get something together. We will then circulate it, and we will then expect everybody to put into that piece of work and send send what whatever the responses back for us to 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 collate. How does that feel? If, if people don't agree, people want to comment, then let me know. But if people agree, show your hand. That's the easiest way. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, excellent. Thank you all very much because it's it's really important to me that you know, I love these discussions. I genuinely do. I'm one of these these people that, that likes attending meetings, particularly when I'm chairing, which is really naughty of me, I know. But I'm just being honest. Um, but I, I, I think it's been a fascinating discussion. But I do like an outcome um, that is going to actually make a difference. And I, I think we've got an outcome that will, will potentially make a difference. We just need to, to keep the focus. So the last item on the agenda, I think I am right in saying, is something that you all know is particularly close to my heart, which is mental health services. And so I understand that we have a presentation. Is that, am I right on that one? Yes, is it Gordon? By, by it's Paula and Gordon. Oh, it's Paula and Gordon, sorry. Double X. Hi, you. Double X. Good morning, everybody. Thank you, Councillor Dempster. Uh, we do, we have got some slides, but actually because of time and actually this feels so nicely fed in from all the discussions you've had in the morning, because I've been acutely listening in and making lots of notes to try and bring it all together. Um, I, I was, uh, Gordon and I were just going to talk to you, but we're happy to circulate the slides afterwards, if that makes oh, sense. Oh, thank you. Yeah. <laughs> Please. please just to remind everybody's a neighbor and well welcome people looking at that you can look at gordon and my beautiful faces instead <laughs> excellent uh, if you're happy we'll, we'll carry on with the agenda item, from councillor dempster so thank you for the invite to come and talk to you all um i think this item uh, of the agenda fits in so beautifully with everything you've been talking about all morning i've written down some things that are really key for me around things sarah said about making um health inequalities everybody's business 
things Mark talked about in terms of using population health management as our uh, methodology of thinking, things that Ivan talked about in terms of making this everybody's day job and part of the day job. Um, Mukesh mentioned quite in the chat actually around involvement, not engagement, and making that a more dynamic process that genuinely creates capacity in our communities and therefore creates real change, which is what we're looking for. Um, so and then Richard mentioned again around real evidence and insight at that really local neighborhood and community based level that means that we can genuinely make the change we need to make for people individually and that's really what makes the difference so bearing all that in mind the um piece of work I wanted just to make sure that the health and well-being board was cited on is something that this board actually in the discussions we had around mental health I think it was before Christmas now um, I, I know Councillor Dempsey you like an outcome so, so we can't <laughs> do an outcome and an action and a thing that's happening that we re hope really will make a difference so um, we've got an opportunity this year with some of the funding we've got in the mental health investment standards pot um, to do a piece of work that we really haven't done before specifically around mental health and well-being um, so we have agreed to work in partnership with the primary care networks as the key partner but not the only partner because it's a good way of getting things going at a neighborhood based level but we do acknowledge the fact that this isn't about neighborhood in its um kind of scientific sense this needs to be around neighborhoods and communities in a way that people experience them and live in them and in a way that means something to them um, but we're using the primary care networks as the core to this and what we're asking those groups of practices to do is do kind of five things um, the outcomes we're looking for is a real understanding and intelligence and narrative around the mental health needs of their local neighborhoods we're also trying to understand more qualitatively, again, our narrative about the impact of COVID on mental health and wellbeing needs in each of those communities. And then we're asking to have those conversations with people and say, well, what is it that would make a difference to you? What would make your lives better? And we know that when we talk about groups of people almost laterally, and we talked about the advisory board from LPT today, I've spent some time with them and they've come up with some brilliant ideas around young people and laughter and spontaneity and things that have been missing from their lives recently, so which is just great to hear and things we can do with them, which is wonderful. But it's that kind of concept about what makes a difference to that group of people specifically that we can do and put in place. Um, and then what we're asking to do, because obviously this does come with investment, is we're asking to do two things. One is to start formalising that partnership that we're looking for in that local community. So that might be practices working with um, local, because obviously this isn't just city, this project, but obviously it does work really well in the city's work. It might be district councils, it might be really local voluntary sectors, it might be action groups, it might be youth groups, it might be faith groups. It almost doesn't matter. It's what works for that community but it's about having the investment and therefore the capacity to get somebody in that local, an organisation in that local community to lead bringing that partnership together in a more formal way. So they start meeting, they start talking, they start working together. Um, and then the other thing we're asking them to do is to think about that investment we're giving them because this is part of our recurrent plan, although this is a one-off piece of work to kind of launch this way of thinking, the way of working. Um, is to think about with this investment then what sort of things do you want to put in place locally like we've talked about council Dempster, in terms of all those other community assets that would work but for that community so it might be outdoor exercise it might be gardening it might be all those things we've discussed before but it's about making it really specific to that community so it works for them and then what we're helping those networks to do is think of ways of properly measuring that so we can understand the impact that has, because that's quite hard to do. But there are lots of different ways of doing it. But the primary care networks themselves have come up with ones they like OCS for, which is fine. I don't mind which it is, as long as they always use the same one so we can start using a common language about the impact those community assets and investments are having on our neighbourhoods. Um, so that's the piece of work that's going on. It gets launched in the next week or two. We've just started communicating primary care networks yesterday formally about the investment and how that works and what we're expecting to get out. We've got some management capacity in LPT and the CCG's um, ring fence to help primary care networks do this piece of work. So it feels like the conversation we had six months ago in terms of that strategy and things we'd like to do at that really shop floor frontline community-based way is is coming alive which is really exciting and I just think it also works really well in alignment to the conversations you've had this morning it felt like it 
it could be an example of bringing that idea to life around actually this is about understanding those health inequalities specifically from a mental health and well-being perspective how have they been impacted even more by covid and what do those communities need us to do together to make a difference for them mm. yeah with the focus on mental health with the focus this time on mental health but that yeah. doesn't mean Excellent. that we learn from those methods that's right we could, that we can roll them out for all different other aspects of health well-being and that's all sorts of other things absolutely Gordon, was there anything you wanted to add? Yes, uh, probably a few things, uh, Chair. The, um, I think Paul has covered a lot. It's been a really rich conversation, actually, and a lot of the points I was going to make, I think, have already been made very eloquently by colleagues um, du during this morning. Um, I was particularly interested in the conversation around proportionate universality and and Michael Marmot's work, I was heavily involved in that in London at the time, between 2008 and 2010. And there's something there that's really interesting about the way that mental health services, on one hand, have always tried to be at the heart of understanding how inequalities and the wider determinants of poor mental health play through. And that can be around, as you pointed out, poverty, um, race, um, trauma, discrimination, all of these things have an impact on mental health. Of course, mental health itself a chronic poor, men, uh, poor mental health is a is a is a pretty strong uh, driver of poverty uh, itself because people with you know, long-term poor mental health problems uh, tend to have real challenges around um, income generation. So there's a huge kind of link with that. And mental health's always been at the, the heart of understanding some of that, but it's also paradoxically carries a lot of baggage historically, particularly around some of its issues towards race and dangerousness, which you and I have had an opportunity to talk about uh, Councillor Dempster and, and which is informing some of the specific engagement work that we're doing um, around black mental health and the wider BAME agenda. So it was fascinating to listen to that. All I wanted to add was really, there's probably three parts to the engagement we're doing in mental health. And I'll give a few specific examples. At, at, at the broadest level, there's the kind of wider public engagement and you'll know through Step Up to Great, we've been working with service users for a number of years now in getting um, the kind of wider transformation it ready for public consultation and engagement and that process is is kind of imminent really um, and colleagues in this meeting will, will know about that and hopefully will be engaged in that so that's I think a really important thing that we've got a duty to do um, a legal duty but also I think a moral duty to make sure that if we're making changes to mental health services we do the broadest engagement we can and that addresses stigma and it gets the conversation out there and then there's some targeted engagement. So that's why I mentioned the work that you and I have had conversations around. I've had conversations with the Councillor Sangster and, and, um, mm. and with uh, African Heritage uh, organisations around some targeted bits of work um, that we're doing to make sure that we're addressing the kind of historical lack of engagement from certain groups in terms of patient engagement within mental health, because um, there are times, and LPT was not as bad as some areas have seen where it's the same it's the same old faces I think to quote you from earlier on Councillor Dempster in terms of the people that engage in that so um, there's some very targeted bits of work but I think the other thing with mental health and it's and it's it's really important is that right at the heart of it is a daily engagement and Richard described it quite rightly earlier on as co-production which is at the heart of what we should be doing and I don't think it always was in mental health services actually I think um, it, it was it was very hit and miss. It was potentially lip service at times, but I think we've got better over the last few years. And I've been working with um, organisations like Imrock and LPT is very engaged in some of this work around Chime, um, which I can talk about. If people are interested, um, but there's something really important about making sure that everything we do, whether it's a care plan or a care pathway, or people's medication plans, or how they work with their you know CPN or how they work with their uh, the, their other, uh, uh, the other organisation um, staff, how we do that in a way that is a genuine partnership. And that's not just about ticking an engagement box, that's actually about how you deliver high quality mental health care, because unless you're working closely with service users, you're not really engendering what you need for recovery. And what you need for recovery are pretty simple things, really. They're about agency in mental health. They're about people feeling that they've got some hope and that they've got some control over what goes on. And if we work in that partnership, and we are getting better at that, um, and LPT is working really hard on this, then what happens is you deliver a partnership that delivers better mental health and you deliver better outcomes for people. 
So there's a so there's th as I say there's the there's that granular day to day bit, and I'll give some brief examples now of how that's playing out. There's the wider targeted groups because we know about the terminus and underlying uh, demographic um, and intersectionality issues that pertain to poor mental health and inform poor mental health and are a result of poor mental health. And then there's a wider engagement bit. So there's a huge amount going on. Um, there's a few, I suppose, very basic examples I could give just for a couple of, uh, literally for about 60 seconds, if that would help. Mm -hmm. So we've got the Recovering Collaborative Care Planning Cafe, which is a nine week program, which um, which and you, you'll know because we've discussed this and colleagues will know the Recovery Cafe is a really exciting shared space for service users and carers. Um, and it's just staff and voluntary and community groups come together, connect around care planning, mental health recovery. So that's a, that's a nine week program that focuses on Chime, which is all around um, uh, connectedness and hope and opportunity and working on identity and meaning. And all of that, I think, does play through the kind of conversation we had earlier about proportional universality. There's some other bits of work we're doing, just to give you some examples of some of the specific work around research. So we, we involve service users and carers heavily in research. Psychology team at the Willows, which is our, and Stuart House, which are rehab inpatient units. They're working really closely with service users um, on some research, two research projects actually, which are around recovery from mental distress. Um, so we're doing that piece of work. There's also involvement in recruitment panels. So obviously we've got experts of experience uh, have been and continue to be involved in all recruitment panels, um, including everything from you know complaints administrator to very senior um, clinical psychologist leads and are heavily involved in making sure that we got the right representation of backgrounds for people when we're recruiting to our perinatal services. So how do we make sure that all of that's covered off? So you'll see the intersectionality uh, chair between equalities uh, and and engagement. Uh, I think I'm hopefully making it clear, but it, it becomes clear in the in the practice, as it were, in the praxis. Bespoke engagement uh, projects for service users and care involvement in developing services as well. Well, we've mentioned the sort of two or three year project that's just about to be launched into a public consultation on step up to great. But also we're doing some detailed work at the moment on um, self-assessment tools and central access point, making sure that that develops and grows that's our self-referral point into the services as you'll know uh councillor dempster and colleagues um making sure that that grows and shapes um and, and is led by service users and carers some work around absconsion for example how do our service users and carers help us manage absconsion better what's the, what's the challenges for that and how can we work in partnership and then lastly but crucially i think you and i have had a conversation around the the wider issue here about as we move forward in a transformational way to improve mental health services, how do we think as a system about making sure that all of the joined up spend on mental health across local authority, VCS and NHS uh, statutory sort of secondary services, traditional secondary services, how do they all begin to work better to population health, to understanding place and neighbourhood, and crucially to delivering on outcomes? And you know my view, and I think it's something we're working on now that outcomes are only really meaningful if they're developed by service users and carers in mental health because they know what it feels like to receive um, good mental health and they know the outcomes that they're looking for. Um, so we're doing some specific work around PROMs and PREMs and all of those are different bits of work but underlying that is a whole bit of work that we're working on uh, including Health Watch colleagues and People's Council around I statements. So how can we support and work with service users to co-produce statements to describe on a personal level what it would look like if outcomes were delivering the improvements that they needed. And there's some stuff around safety planning and harm reduction as well that plays into that. So um, that's a bit of a whistle stop tour, but I think it's probably enough for now. Um, uh, so as I say, just a few words around our approach, my own personal thoughts about how it links with, it, with equalities, but also some examples about some of the day-to-day -day work that LPT particular uh, is, is involved in. I hope that's helpful. That's brilliant. Thanks. Thank you, Gordon. I'm going to bring in Rita. Thank you, Vi. Um, uh, at the risk of sounding like a pleb, can I just clarify that PCN, uh, does that just the network, does that just include uh, primary care providers in terms of GPs or does it include other people as well? Thank you. Um, I'm happy to answer that question. Um, the primary care network in its truest sense is a group of practice only, but what we're trying to do is to create that 
partnership with all those other organisations that are vital to this response in each neighbourhood. So although the because of just the way we're trying to do this fairly quickly and that's the way the contracts are set up, that's the way we get the money out of you like into the community. But what we're asked them to do is to create that integrated neighbourhood team with other partners so that this piece of work doesn't just become a primary care piece of work. Okay, right. Can I just come back in there then um just a couple of po quick points i want to make um the i'm really pleased that you're working at much more of a neighborhood uh community level on the ground but i think targeted services are really important so i hope that part of this is about empowering the inclusion of the voluntary and community sector and also in terms of providing cultural specific services. I think in recent times, for understandable reasons at times, you know, we uh, all statutory agencies have looked for uh, um, organizations that's kind of a one-stop shop that can provide all the services that you know, we want to contract. And what that's led to, as far as mental health services in the city are concerned, is that, you know, over the decades, there was a fabric of uh, in infrastructure built up amongst community and voluntary organizations that actually provided much more uh, localized services that really understood the needs of their communities that had the both the cultural competencies as well as language and you know, other specific needs that their communities had. And in awarding large contracts, we actually wiped out some of the sector that was providing those crucial services, small organizations providing tailored services. So what I would say is in any investments that we make through this uh, uh, service or in mental health generally, that we actually try and build back uh, um, that infrastructure of small localized organizations where it offers the people who need those services a choice. If one organization can't provide something that's very specific for them, there will be another organization, another community led organization that they can go to. And I think that's really important. It's important for white working class people. It's important for LGBTQ community, BAME communities, I think across the board. And so I would really appeal for whatever resources are available for us to think about uh, uh, giving the contracts and rebuilding our infrastructure in the co community and voluntary sector. And the last question I just wanted to ask was, you talked about resourcing. What kind of resources are we talking about? Are we, you know, what kind of money is being made available to these PCNs? Okay, thanks. Thanks for that, Rita. Um, I'm going to bring in Mark and then Paula. Is that, is that okay? Thank you, Chair. Um, listening to this morning's conversations, one of the things that strikes me is that there's a real opportunity here to include a different domain of thinking. We've been talking largely all morning about what, we're, what we tend to see in the NHS as pathologies. So you're sick, I don't feel well. And there's a difference between not being sick and feeling well and happy and being resilient. So I think in relation to Gordon's points in particular, I think there's a real opportunity here for the local authority and the NHS, the NHS to expand its thinking in terms of how can we embed genuine well-being and genuine resilience within communities with all the elements of provision that are under a local government's um, spectrum all the universal services offered by right. the NHS. So what I'm not talking about is in living in some kind of lotus land of eternal um, positive happiness. But I think there is something about mental well-being, uh, mental health, which is not just the absence of disease, but it is about a sense of positivity and a, and a sense that you can cope with potentially what life may throw at you, its ups and downs. I would have to say, I think LPT has done a really good job as an example in lockdown in terms of making materials available to people, which focuses on um, small habits and actions that foster well-being 
as opposed to deal with mental ill health, frank mental ill health. But it's a huge, if you think of everything from green spaces and transport and that identity of communities, it can be a real nurturing factor for well-being. So I just want us to think not just about treating illness and, and deficit and disability, but also to think about how we can foster um, positive spirits, a sense of resilience as we go forward yeah. together. Absolutely, Mark. Can I just come back on that, Councillor Dempster, briefly, just to say I, I couldn't agree more. If we'd have had more time, I would have gone on to have talked about, I mentioned Chime earlier on, but actually a great deal of the work we're doing, Mark, is around, as you know, the kind of five ways to well-being. And, 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 and I think what hasn't come out this morning, just because we haven't had time, is is that actually a lot of the neighbourhood and place work that we're doing and a lot of the a lot of the work that we're doing in terms of our partnership is exactly your point. How do organisations like LPT make sure that they move into that space of well-being and not just focus on kind of determinants of, you know, traditional secondary services? And I think building partnerships with primary care, better partnerships with primary care through the neighbourhood, through the PCNs, and also strengthening our relationships with the VCS gets you into a different space, but also off, off working with local authority colleagues around uh, prevention and promotion issues. That's exactly the space that we need to be in. And your points around green spaces and, and the broader determinants of well-being are, are absolutely um, uh, crucial. That That's absolutely um, part of our, in a sense, core conversation with LPT, I think, just to reassure you on that. And if we have more time at another time, we can, you know, perhaps go into that in more depth and detail. But but the point being, I couldn't agree, I couldn't agree with you more. Thanks, Gordon. I'm just going to bring Paula back in, perhaps maybe want to pick up some of the points that Councillor Patel brought, and then I'll be summing up. Thank you very much. Um, Councillor Patel and Mark, I think both, as, as Gordon's alluded to, your points just fit beautifully with this scheme that we're talking about. So um, in terms of making it culturally sensitive and responsive to each neighbourhood, that's entirely what this is about, is about splitting up that bigger investment pot and that bigger piece of work and going back down into communities. And we're talking about those primary care networks and partnerships being built up with those local voluntary sector organisations and um, community companies and organisations that do that very lo it's kind of local piece of pieces of work. That's entirely what it's about. As you say, every community and every individual needs to feel whatever well-being means to them. In, or they feel it in a different way and therefore we need to provide the support in a different way so i'm hoping that um, i'm articulating well enough that i think what you're saying is entirely what we're trying to do which is really positive um in terms of the money the the money we've invested this time into launching this piece of work um for the whole system for llr is eight hundred and fifteen thousand pounds it's not small amounts of money and we acknowledge the fact as gordon's alluded to that health and mental health and well-being isn't just about the acute end we recognize completely this is about the whole spectrum of mental health and well-being um, and as mark said it's not about feeling lotus happy all the time but it is about having that sense of i'm i'm feeling actually really quite positive about life and i'm feeling like i'm moving forward and not just surviving as it were so that's kind of the lower end for us of what good might look like and then we're working through the whole spectrum so i think it's really exciting stuff it feels like it's really moved on Absolutely. Well, I, I just want to say a huge thank you to Paula and Gordon. Um, a, a, a massively important piece of work. And I think, you know, I don't need to keep, keep saying it while I do, really. The fact is, mental health is just as important as physical health. And we need to have equity of, of resources and equity of esteem. And this is one um, further way in which we are getting there. Um, and I am massively happy about it. Um, just, be, you know, a, a, a number of you will know that I have experience on a personal basis of the mental health services. Um, and, you know, I just, I know how important this is to many, many people. Um, in the city and I, I feel really heartened by the changes that are being made. I would really hope that we have an update um, at the next Health and Wellbeing Board meeting. 
Um, there's one other thing I wanted to say. I'd um, spoken to um, Gordon with uh, Councillor Patel, Councillor Hunter, um, and it, we've had a number of um, discussions recently with the Black community, and every time a big issue, particularly for the Black community, is mental health issues. And um, we also had a, a, a chat with Councillor Sangster. And so it is really important that we move forward with part of this engagement process in the coming months is a sort of symposium um, type event um, with members of the Black community so that we can really begin to um, in, engage uh, with them on this very, very important issue. Again, it's about us learning lessons as we go along from this piece of work. What we don't want to be doing is, is constantly reinventing the wheel. Um, again, I love the idea that we can work together on this piece of work. So although this is primarily CCG and LPT moving forward, um, I, I'm really heartened by the role of the city council and so for example Rita you know we have neighborhood centers we have um, our leisure centers there's a huge role for our resources in terms of addressing the mental health issues um, of the people of this city and so I am really um, pleased that we have that so um I really look forward to the update at the next uh, meeting and thank you so much for this piece of work. I think it's absolutely excellent. So thank you so much. Can we just note the um, note the future meetings, the dates of future future meetings? We will be circulating some suggestions for the development session as well. I haven't been notified of any other urgent business, so I want to thank you all very much for the high level of engagement. Absolutely fantastic. Looking forward to the next meeting. Thank you.